welcome back to the Exponential Finance Podcast. Today, we welcome Thomas McMahon, who's the co-founder and CEO of the Air Carbon Exchange. Good morning, Tom. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for having me. It will be a great conversation. I'm really curious to learn the latest of carbon trading. Rather than start at the beginning, start at the end. What is the environment today and what makes you believe that there is finally a sustainable market for carbon and emission trading? Let's start where society is today, coming out of the COVID environment. I think the awareness, environmental awareness at individual level, as well as at company and country or state level is, is greatly enhanced. We've all become very aware of our own personal environment, that's for sure, depending on what country you've been in, whether you've been completely locked down within your four walls or inability to travel or cross borders or interact with other people, but also the significant change literally in the physical atmosphere. People have seen cities get cleaned up. Take enough cars off the road and take enough airplanes out of the air and slow down the shipping. Doesn't do a lot for economics, but does a lot for the environment. And I think that's where we are. Um, at the same time, from a corporate responsibility standpoint, there was a big gap. If you go back to the end of the Kyoto Protocol um, in 2012 to where we are today, there really was no organized structure around it, but there was a greater willingness to do something. I think whether it's scientific that we're definitely the world is getting hotter and the environment is changing and whether it's raining more, there's less water. But more importantly, from a regulatory standpoint, the major stock exchanges and regulators around the world have basically said, if you're a listed company, you have to have an ESG policy, right? And what is ESG? Environment, social and governance. From a newsy standpoint, everybody gets the S part. The S part is very much the standard of, do we have enough women on our board of directors? Do we have enough equality in pay? Are we racially diverse? Those things are very much in the news today, but the E part and the G part are really the part that people are trying to figure out what to do. So the G part, I've filed my ESG mandate with my regulator, whether it's the Tokyo Stock Exchange or NYSE in New York or LSE in London or DAX in Germany. Okay, I want to be carbon neutral. In the case of like a Microsoft or an Amazon, we want to be carbon negative, actually, meaning put projects into the environment once we've gone carbon neutral. How do you achieve that? And that's really the warm and fuzzy is I'm going to plant some trees. People understand trees. There's a physicality to it. More importantly is how do we hedge this how do we actually put it into a regulated environment where as a listed company or a regulated bank or such, that we can actually prove we're doing something? There's actually no exchange to do that on today, amazingly. There's a lot of over-the-counter markets. There's different countries. Japan is one of them. Korea is another that have created these emissions trading schemes, ETSs. China has now moved into that with their own style of it. But it doesn't make it fungible, meaning what's good in Japan is not necessarily good in Korea even though they actually they've got their own goal. Everybody's trying to figure out how do we offset one metric ton of CO2? Um, and that's the underlier. If you look at other commodities, if you look at gold, people understand what an ounce or a kilogram of gold is. If you're in Chicago, people understand what a bushel of wheat is. If you're in New York on NYMEX or in, the, or in London on ICE, IPE, you understand what a barrel of oil is. People don't necessarily understand what a ton of CO2 is. You can define it though. And it does get traded as an asset, but again, it doesn't sit in any global regulated exchange. And that's what air carbon is. Air carbon is taking that next step. Um, I've been very fortunate over my career to have been part of benchmark building. Going back to the early 80s, I was working on uh, the formation of the refined products markets in New York, gasoline and fuel oil. And then in 83 on the crude oil launch, which today we take as a benchmark, one of the benchmarks, WTI. And then in 1990, I worked on the natural gas, uh, Henry Hub natural gas contracts, and then traded those for 12 years in New York before coming out to Asia and worked in Japan and, and, and China and Korea and then Singapore and then on to the Middle East and worked on the Dubai Mercantile Exchange and defining Middle East crude benchmarks. We take that all for granted today. Nobody hesitates to use a WTI or a Brent contract to hedge their crude oil, whether they're in Switzerland or Swaziland or Tokyo or Singapore. It's accepted. But for some reason, people don't accept a standard around carbon because it's been very state run. Well, that's changing. With the advent of the ESGs, that's understood everywhere. And the UN protocols around sustainable development goals, that's understood everywhere. So applying that to a fungible standard around an exchange is really the goal for air carbon that somebody in Tokyo, as much as in Singapore or in Seoul or Shanghai or Abu Dhabi or London can hedge an underlying ton of CO2 on a standardized product on a regulated market. And that's where I think the next level is for carbon. 
Go back 10 years and we had sure. like this European mm -hmm. scheme, the European ETS, right. which yep. I think had a bad reputation because it was essentially over allocated. And if you put it in the context of the ESG goals, the ultimate objective of making this tradable is to drive innovation in low emission technologies. And so right. if you over allocate and there's no pressure to drive that innovation, then mm -hmm. it's kind of for naught. And I think 10 years ago, we had like the US, Europe, and New Zealand, maybe. And you were now talking about Japan, Korea, China. How are the newer markets compared to, let's call it a failure on the European mm -hmm. side? I wouldn't call it a failure on the European side. And, and again, this is sort of the misnomers of carbon. The European market is an allowance market, and it's only specific and fungible to the EU. It's actually irrelevant to the rest of the world. And it's not a carbon credit. It's an allowance to, basically, it's an allowance to pollute. First of all, it's a vibrant market. I'm not disallowing the legitimacy of the market. It's a great market. And it does have a true price for the underlying emissions, 30 plus euros now. But it's not fungible. And what it does is it's only relevant to the EU and it's an allowance market. So they produce, say, 100 million allowances. And pre-Lehman, the market was very valid. And basically, the EU was polluting. So swapping in these allowances, if you were a clean entity, you got to sell your allowances, and that gave you money to stay clean. If you were dirty, you had to pay a penalty. You bought an allowance, and that kept the market. The market was very vibrant, trading up in the 20-plus euro range. And then Lehman happened, and then by 2012, actually, Germany had cleaned up enough. It was They weren't even using the allowances, and there was too many in the market. And it drove the price down to five, six euros. And it languished there considerably for a long time. And then in 2017, so 2015, you had the Paris Accord signed. And then by 2017, the EU said, hey, let's do a one for two split. Basically, they have the number of allowances in the market, which was very smart. It was like a stock buyback almost. But again, it was a finite number. So they halved it at, say, six euros. People thought the market would be vibrant. They never anticipated that their timing was so impeccable that it didn't go from six euros to 12 euros. It went from six euros to 18 euros to 22 euros to 27 euros. And it has recovered fully post the COVID dip. Now it's in the 30s plus with demand. And it really is the only exchange traded price for a representation of polluting fundamentally. Um, that's an open market. But again, it's an allowance market and it's not a circular market. It's only relevant to the EU. Your notation to the circularity of carbon, a carbon credit is produced by a project. It's a clean development project or a forestry project or a methane capture project or wind or, or solar project. The additionality of those credits is very important to the project. For the most part, the project would have not have been built or financed if you weren't allowed to add those credits, that extra bit of revenue that can create the incentive to build that project, whether a large solar or wind project in Vietnam now is going on large forestry projects in Colombia, uh, in the Amazon, um, that would not take place if you didn't have the additionality of credits. The importance of selling those credits in an efficient market, that revenue then goes back into the projects. So the projects can have a long runtime. I guarantee that they've generated income, potentially an annuity for the entities that are actually on the land, in the case of like the Amazon projects, more sustainable forestry in terms of the Colombia projects. So you need a circular nature of the initial funding of the project the initial year of credit creation, the investment, the credits get sold, that funds flow back to the project and do it for year two, year three, year you know, seven, year 10. Some of the projects potentially have a 50 year life cycle. So you need to have that nature of fungibility that if somebody invests in a project in Colombia, they could be living in Switzerland or they could be a Japanese corporate. Or the other side of it is you've got Amazon now with their multiple billion dollars or Alphabet with their green bond market pumping money into those projects. Those projects will create the credits and the credits will sell and then the money will flow back to the projects. So you need that circular nature of the market in a regulated structure. That's the significant change from where it had been from the EU. Um, the EU wasn't a failure. The EU just went through a period of actually Europe got a little bit cleaner in its economic downturns. <laughs> But now the world is picking up again. So you, it's a significant shift in the awareness of let's go to the next level of cleaning up the environment. Aviation is a clear case of that. Shipping now is really the next big goal of getting standards around the cement industry. Everybody understands cement. It accounts for about 7% of global pollution. It's pretty significant. Those had never been addressed previously. We had looked at utilities. We had looked at ground transportation or factories. And now it's, we're taking steps beyond that. 
when the projects originate these <coughs> credits, is this basically on an annual basis? They get new credits then for the kilotons that they save as long as they keep sustaining the forest, for example? Yeah, forest is a very easy one because you can see it. It's got yeah. the, the physical nature of it. And you know that 1,000 hectares or, or you know 3,000 acres. And we say, okay, you, basically you create a box, right? And you put a boundary around it and make sure that and you put management in it. Or maybe you're replanting, right? You're taking a naked piece of land and putting a, a new growth in. Or biodiversity is another way to address forests. Um, yeah, so you figure out what the tree is, where it's located, what its life cycle is in. The interesting thing about forests is they actually sequester carbon. They actually take carbon in and hold it. It's finite. You can figure out that if it's a mature forest, it's got this many years to live. These are the size of the trees. This is the new growth, old growth that it's going to hold, say, 100,000 tons per year over a 10-year cycle, so it'll generate a million carbon credits. That's a simplistic approach, but that is how forests work. As opposed to if you look at a methane capture project, which can be relevant to anything from dumps, from waste cycling, to agricultural effluent cases, say, the palm oil industry here in Southeast Asia. Palm oil in and of itself has got challenges because it, it actually takes down forests and replaces it with trees, but it's a, it's a monoculture tree. It has no diversity. But the other end of the life cycle is after you process palm oil, you take out the oil and you take out the shells and different things get utilized. And then you have an effluent pool. That effluent pool evaporates and in the evaporation process, you're producing methane, very similar to the pig industry, same thing. Methane is 21 times more toxic than CO2. That if you can capture methane and reduce it, you can flare burn off the methane, not use it for anything else, and get a 20x credit to one ton of CO2 when you flame methane. More importantly is that when you capture the gas, then the gas can be used for something else. And now you've got cheap power, right? It can be used in remote areas. So there's a lot of different things that can be done with methane. And that comes out of both the agricultural industry, the, the recycling industry, and also the energy industry. So if you look at West Texas, they've got a big methane issue out there and trying to manage uh, in this downturn cycle of energy do they even want to uh, maintain flaring of the methane or just let it escape? The inverse side of that is that the credit industry, the carbon industry, could actually create a very viable, sustainable market of methane capture and actually produce cheap energy off of it. Yeah, so there's a lot of interesting scaling opportunities. But again, you need the central market to allow for people to price it in a regulated space as opposed to today, most of that is priced in an over-the-counter market. Exchange-like bulletin board architecture is very opaque and also a very high cost to the project producers or registers. 20, 30% is very often the cost. So if you're producing a credit for three bucks and you got to pay 30% to the guy to sell your credit, that's extreme. That can be brought down to sub 100 basis points to less than 1% if you do it on a regulated exchange. So more funds would flow back into the project structures. That's what we're doing on air carbon. Ultimately, then the creation of the carbon credit, that's the issue inside. Who would be buying it on the exchange and trading it? Before the airlines got grounded, it was the airlines. You know, the airlines have a huge carbon footprint. And under the post Paris Accords, you had what was called the Corsia Agreements carbon offset reduction scheme for international aviation. And that was under a regulation developed by ICAO and IATA. ICAO being the International Civilian Aviation Organization that oversees all airlines in the world, all routes, equipment, slots, landing slots, and such. Um, under the ICAO, basically from January 1st, 2021, there was a baseline that was being set on reportability by all state airlines, which encompasses basically 195 countries of signatories to it, 300 plus airlines. We're reporting to ICAO for 2019, 2020. They were gonna get a baseline. And from that point forward, between 2021 and 2035, airlines, as they grew, would have to basically offset their growth. That's the good news. The bad news was when everybody got grounded in January and February, the airlines started screaming, going, we're going bankrupt. If you force us to use 2020 in our baseline, which means their baseline would be lower, which means their upside risk would be much greater. Through political arm twisting, ICAO caved and said, okay, we're going to discount 2020. We'll go back to 2019 from 2021, which means the airlines have got a much longer lead time become compliant. Doesn't mean they're not buying carbon credits. They are. More still from the CSR side, the marketing side, as opposed to the compliance and treasury side, which will come later on. But the airlines, they, unfortunately, airliners are dirty to this point, um, and they can't get to zero. You're not going to be flying across the Pacific on an electric airliner 
reality is jet fuel can get clean to a point, engines can get clean to a point, but they're still always going to have a carbon footprint. Just for example, 2019, 4.7 billion passengers flew internationally. It's not counting domestic. Domestic pushes it up towards 14 billion. The average carbon footprint on those international flights was seven tenths of a ton of carbon per passenger. So do that 4.7 billion, you're looking at basically 3.8 billion tons of carbon exposure that needed to be offset. So there's a market. So the airlines are going to crawl back, but then you've got shipping alongside of that. So the International Shipping Agency is now looking to adopt very similar regulations. And shipping accounts for multiple percentages of international carbon emissions also. So you've got that's two industry sets of buyers. And then you have the Amazons and the Microsofts of the world and the, and the Apples of the world who are global leaders who have massive infrastructure. If all you did was look at AWS on their data center footprint globally, how do you offset that? And those are called immovable objects. Plus, you've got energy consumption and such. Um, so their objective is to be carbon neutral. They're natural buyers. They're not clean development mechanisms. They're buyers. The investment class itself, carbon as an investment class, it's an asset class now. So if you think about it, again, when the Japanese began this and UN began it back in the early 2000s, I mean, their goal was to be good corporate, socially responsible country level in Japan, but also, you know, the Mitsui's and Mitsubishi's of the world. They put their money where their mouth was under Kyoto and bought credits. They learned a lot of lessons in that. So they'll do it better the second time around under Paris Accords now. During the time of Kyoto, it was really 47 countries, and it was really sub-30 that were really participatory. Under that, basically, you were able to export dirty industries. And this is not making anybody bad. It was just so China was able to send some dirty industries to Thailand and Malaysia and Vietnam. There was nothing wrong with it. It was what you did. You got it out of your own country and you gave it to somebody else who needed it at the time, right? They were really developing nations. Well, they've come significantly past that 20 years later, but also now they're signatories to the Paris agreements. They're signatories to the Corsia agreements. They're signatories to the IMO in terms of shipping. Those countries are like going, we're not taking your dirty industries. It's up to you to clean them up and we're going to take care of ourselves. So there you've got a market now developing that is really nascent in that everybody's learning how to do it, but everybody has a willingness to do it. And I think that's the key. So the buy side is the ESG compliant companies, uh, global leaders, the Amazon and Microsofts of the world. A number of the Europeans are doing the same thing, but at the EU level, UK is now saying, look, we actually have seen significant changes. We want to keep this going. So the big supporters are wind, right? And they got a lot of wind around the UK and they're going to use that to their advantage. And they've shut down like one of the last coal fired power plants operating in UK. It's gone. So that's where we are. And it's the development of a new asset class. We've got natural buyers and producers now. There's probably a few airlines where I've seen if you book <coughs> your international flight, like they try mm. to sell you insurance as well. You get an option that can actually offset your carbon footprint, pay them the seven tenths of a ton price. The, the issue there is there's really actually no transparency on what they're paying for their carbon. There's a lot of cheap carbon credits out in the OTC market that you can buy from legacy projects for 20 or 30 cents. And uh, the airlines are happy to have you pay $7 or eight pounds. Or, look, business is business, but that has to stop. You need to have, look, this is what it's costing you. And this is the project that you're supporting. And I think that's really the key. So, and some of them have done that. Some have said, this is the project you're supporting, but there's really not a lot of deep dive on what their actual Nobody's supposed to make money on carbon except the projects, to be honest with you. The broker deal is you can make a little bit. You've got transaction fees and you've got carry costs. And, but the reality is the, the, the biggest nature of 20 or 30% is outlandish. The key is the circularity. So if you're paying 50 cents for a carbon credit and you're charging voluntarily, your passenger pays you seven bucks, you should be buying 14 carbon credits at 50 cents, not one. That's my argument. So. We keep sticking to the airlines and we're saying now 2019 is the baseline. If you take the macro perspective on where we are heading with global warming, right. is that sufficient? No, I think the airlines, and I'm not trying to pick on the airlines, and I don't think the airlines are actually going to be the leaders in this. It's the related industries that are going to be the leaders. How much technology can change in the engine industry? How efficient can Rolls-Royce or, or GE become... But more importantly, it's the awareness around the technologies. What are the aircraft actually being built of the fuel industry? You know, the BPs of the world and the shells of the world are hugely aware of what they've got to become in the next five to 10 years or 15 years. So the obvious might be, yeah, I can figure out my carbon footprint as I fly from Tokyo to Singapore. It's a ton, by the way, of CO2 in, a, in the most efficient airliner. 
the more important thing is what happens behind that scene. Are the planes getting more efficient? Are the fuels, are there alternatives? Do we need to fly as much as we need that we have been? Now we're being, you can clearly see that we don't. Here we are sitting on Zoom and you can still do business. And more importantly, it's the other related industries. So the airlines are just one part. It was an article published today about you know, new investment classes and data centers. Even though the real estate industry is under huge pressure, do we need as many malls as we have? Do people want to continue to live in high rises or are people going to move back to the suburbs again? Because the anticipation is that this is not over this time. It's going to happen continuously going forward with environmental change. So people want a little bit of grass again. So you've got this movement out of the cities. So as a result of it, a lot of inner city real estate is being very financially challenged. But the data center industry, which is the other side of that, here we're sitting here on Zoom, God knows where in the global cloud we're actually getting picked up and being transmitted or routed through. But the reality is that's going to continue to grow. That industry has got growth. Other ones are being challenged. And in the middle of that, again, is compliance. And so we've all got this physical carbon footprint that we're all looking to mitigate in, in time. On the airline side, I think ANA, the Japanese airline, they've been for a few years now on it to operate with the bio company and they're producing some fuel out of algae right yeah. here at Haneda Airport. So, so that's yeah. been interesting to watch as well. And it is. And the news is great. But the reality is it's one flight out of about every 17,000 that actually gets that fuel in it. So, yeah, so it doesn't have scale yet. No. And it's, so it's on the marketing side. It's on that CSR feel good it's going to move to the compliance and the treasury side of the book going, okay, now we've really got to do this. How much of this fuel can we change and actually fly off of this? There's a lot of people working around that. It makes for great news and hopefully it will scale in time. In the overall process of establishing the exchange, where are you with our carbon at this point? We're actually coming to market very rapidly. Like anything else, technology is always an interesting challenge. Regulations, getting your structures right, your custodial structures right, and all your banking and crossing uh, all the T's and dotting the I's right in the middle of that and the onboarding process. So we've got very good commercial interest. We're going to do a soft launch. Our target is actually August 19th. And then we're looking into September to do more of a bigger splash. We've got a number of international partners that want to participate with us in the September announcements. First, we want to get a heartbeat and a good steady pulse. We'll have a, a much bigger uh, commercial rollout in September. The key is especially, again, like we can't travel. We're completely dependent. Doing all of this at a distance is quite interesting. Um, I've done enough exchange startups where I've been on airplanes for six, seven months, making sure you, you get in front of all of the people. We can't get in front of anybody on this, but it's amazingly cooperative doing it in, in this new world. So lots of electronic documentation and confirmations. And August 19th is our target for our first OTC, basically reported transaction on exchange. We'll have volume, price, time, uh, counterparties, on-chain, full transparency with a settlement price. Where do you fall regulatory-wise in, in Singapore? Well, Singapore, very interestingly, as a country level, and the Prime Minister has spoken about this quite openly, the country itself is a signatory to the Paris Agreements, is a signatory to Corsia Agreements. Uh, they want to become a global leader in sustainability and environmental compliance as a country. And uh, this is, of course, a broad stroke of industries. We're just one part of that. The way we actually began the air carbon journey was actually with a conversation with one of the regulatory bodies here, uh, Enterprise Singapore. They've taken on a bigger role in their, uh, uh, their oversight of commodities in a broad stroke, regulation, technology, and incubator cycles. The conversation was me sort of being the exchange guy that grabbed me and said, Tom, do you think that you could build a carbon market in Singapore? Yeah, Singapore has become a centerpiece of the trading industry, especially the commodity trading industry, over the last decade with enterprises support, as well as MAS. More importantly, the country has a willingness to support carbon offset methodologies and, and environmental sustainability uh, projects. The fact that there really wasn't, outside of the EU, EEX market, um, there really was not a, a, an open market architecture for trading of carbon. So that was an interesting opportunity. It's a centerpiece for transportation, both sh shipping and aviation. So I went, yeah, I think we could do this. So they say, could you do it on blockchain? I went, absolutely. Uh, I think blockchain is a phenomenal fit for commodities. One of the biggest challenges in Asia is you've got a massive amount of water in between the counterparties, right? And every time you've got to take something out of a warehouse, put it on a ship or put it in a tanker and send it to somebody else and you're crossing international, just anything that could go wrong can go wrong, right? Whether it's compliance or reapothecation of bills of lading or warehouse receipts and all the shenanigans that happen with that. 
Blockchain distributed ledger architecture completely takes that out of it. You, you've got a definitive record from the point of whether it's from production or warehousing or load ports to discharge ports, even in your manufacturing cycles. Putting carbon as an asset class on it and adding all of the chain of a carbon credit life cycle in a single point in time, it's just really a, an interesting opportunity for me. And I had done it initially with gold and it worked, but gold is very physical and, and it's standards. So that began the conversation and taking it forward. And my partner on this is a fellow named uh, William Pesos, Bill Pesos. Bill's got a long double decade background in carbon going all the way back to his days in, in Brazil and then through the US and Europe and then into Asia. A phenomenal, phenomenal background in carbon. When he and I sat and talked, we said, okay, what, what's the most valid point for Singapore to begin with? And because Singapore is an aviation hub and a shipping hub, we, that was our initial target was looking at the, the Corsia regulatory compliance opportunity. We've grown significantly since that and over the last 18 months and look how broadly we could create product baskets for offerings that are far beyond just aviation compliance or shipping compliance and how the world is looking back at carbon going, we want to be supportive of industries, we want to invest, but we want something that we understand. They don't necessarily understand uh, methane capture off of the back of palm oil effluent pools. They do understand trees. Um, they do understand the nature of whether it's a mature forest or we're saving the Amazon or we're replanting deforested areas or, or creating diverse bios from monocultures like a certain planting industries, replanting with more diversity. That can all produce credits. And that's the interesting thing. So that was where we've moved to. And then we moved into the financial industry interest and the banking industry interest and the hedge fund interest. If you sit down with, go say, okay, hey, we want to want some exposure to carbon. But we as a BlackRock, we don't want to manage a forest in Colombia. We want a standardized asset class that's on an exchange in a regulated environment that we can go in and say, okay, now we've, we own this diverse basket and it will be diverse. We've got exposure to say forestry or we've got exposure to uh, methane capture projects, but I'm not dependent on a single country or a single project. Now I've got a diverse basket, which is what you want. You want to spread your risk, but you also want to have the ability to create a securitized product. The financial industry has been very successful in doing it and everything else but carbon. We understand that it's a ton of CO2, but we don't understand how do we own it. And people would be hard pressed other than buying your one ton offset on a flight to London on BA. How do you own carbon? The Mitsui's of the world, the Mitsubishi's of the world did it by investing in individual projects, but they could take that corporate exposure and they had teams of people that they could throw at it and go, but that's risk today, as opposed to having a portfolio that de-risks that, but standardizes the price and delivery mechanism, storage and custody and and so, yeah, so what we're doing with carbon, we're changing the way that you can own carbon, invest in projects safely, but also have a standard for financing is very important. That a financing bank can look at it and go, okay, we've got a liquidity pool on an exchange. You've got diversified risk, but you understand the product that you own because it's now regulated. We put that all in the, into it and we said, okay, this is what we're going to go forward with, which brought us to the point we are today for air carbon. It's been interesting talking to the custodians, getting them up to speed, because we've had to educate almost everybody along this, including the banks. Other than like a Citibank or a JP Morgan or a few of the London banks, none of the other banks have ever been in the carbon business. They've lent money like to a green bond, but they actually don't want to know what they've lent money to. They don't look beyond that other than, hey, yeah, we're doing a green thing. Well, where was that money actually going? What's it actually doing? Now we can educate them and teach them. And they're like, oh, wow, this is okay. This is where we're supposed to be in our ESG. The concept of fungibility at the top <laughs> level, every carbon credit that you trade on the exchange is fungible because it represents one ton of carbon, yeah. but then it also has the traceability to the project. So if I now want the flavor of forest versus methane capture, I can then go out and specifically create that portfolio. Yes. Did I understand it correctly? Yeah, we've given some very interesting opportunities. So, so we have three carbon types that we're launching with. One is uh, the Corsia token, which is fits underneath the ICAO course your compliance for six different types of project registries that would fit that basket. And that happens to include forestry and, and some other diverse registries. We've also produced a nature token. So that nature token is exactly what it says. It's pretty much forestry dominated, but it's a diverse group of projects. It's not just a, a project in Colombia or Peru or Indonesia. It can be all of them. And then the third product, I should say, that, we've, that we're putting together is what's called a premium product. And that adheres to the UN protocol for UNF, what's called UNF triple Cs. And that has what are called the SDGs attached. The importance of that is it just doesn't deal with a project of, okay, I'm mitigating or offsetting a, a, a ton of carbon. What am I doing socially good? 
And fundamentally, if you look at a project like a cook stove project, uh, we work very closely with Ken Newcomb um, out of Washington, D.C. and the Sequest Group, who have basically globally put cook stoves in rural environments. And if you're not familiar with a cook stove, basically what it does is if you go to most rural villages around the world today, um, they burn wood on the floor of, and they don't have flues and they don't have fancy fireplaces or wood burning stoves or anything like that. And pretty typically, it's the women and the children that are home all day in that environment. And it's usually the women are the ones who have to go out and gather the wood. So if you put those three factors together, one, pollution, world health levels, of the damage to young children, asthmatic conditions and such. Um, the second one is deforestation. If you're continually burning wood inefficiently. The third one is that you put the women in danger by sending them out. They go further and further and further away from villages into the woods and bad things happen. You can eliminate a lot of that with putting a cook stove in. And a cook stove basically creates 70% efficiency on how you burn your wood. You can continue to burn wood. You can also add pellets to that, which so you start the deforestation or reduce deforestation. Home safety, uh, suddenly the children are no, more, no longer asthmatic. The PSI, the 2.5 particulates drop 90%. Um, you got healthy kids and you don't have women being attacked in the woods anymore. So uh, those are the three SDGs that are very obvious that are attached to that project, but there's 22 others. So those are the good things. So they have a premium and, and people invest in those because then you're not just changing one thing, you're changing multiples and you can significantly change lives. So they have a higher value, which is a good thing. So a carbon credit. So if you buy like, say, just a methane capture, that could be three or $4 credit, where if you're buying an, an SDG premium credit, it could be up to 12, 14, $15. To produce a cook stove costs about six, $7. So everything above that, the money then goes back into, and now they can build two stoves for every one that they sell, or two and a half stoves. And it becomes very circular in the return of, of of that funding. So that's the three we're supporting initially. And then we're looking at country tokens. So we've had, in the course of our conversations, it's a very interesting, again, you've got to take industry feedback. So Canada, the United States, and Colombia very specifically said, and actually a fourth one, we've got an Amazon conversation also going, could you create a coin for us? Could you create a Canadian coin or a US forestry token or a Colombia token or an Amazon token? That that in itself becomes the investment vehicle and then the credits and the projects sit below that. This is how markets develop, right? It's not just me thinking I'm the smartest guy in the block going, hey, I'm going to give you what you need. No, we're going to start small and then you're going to tell us what you would like and what you would support and scale. So we're seeing this evolution already, even pre-market launch. The creation of the product through the token smart contracts and blockchain should also be much easier to experiment with it a bit, right? Yes. Yeah, your cost of failure is much lower than it would have been in the more traditional markets, you know? Not that anybody likes to be wrong, but yeah, developing a product even 10 years ago, you were looking at multiples of hundreds of thousands of dollars in marketing and, and things. You can move much more quickly and you can test and experiment and tweak much more quickly than you could previously. We're two old guys here, or two older guys, and you've got the picture of the pit behind you. We've come a long way from physical commodities markets with the pit and people screaming to electronic trading, and now really something that fundamentally will have a social impact, because it sounds super exciting. I mean, I think we're, we're all cheering for this to work out. And Yeah, it's quite interesting. So I used to be in the trading pit over there when this painting was painted. Yeah, we've moved considerably beyond that. We truly have global markets today, right? Market access is, the barriers have been broken down and now you've got, they're even being broken down more with the whole DeFi structures and decentralized finance. And yeah, it's really, it's really interesting time. And you create a platform that is open and ultimately innovation becomes decentralized then as well. It's, as, as you said, it's not depending only on you and your co-founder. Other people who see that and have great ideas, what else could be done to yeah. make a difference? And, and then it becomes a, a true multiplier and exponential effect on it. Yeah, we've had some very interesting conversations recently with the ICC and the World Bank. So I don't know if you're familiar with ICC, but I'm sure if you're sitting in, as, a, as you are as a foreigner, like the, the American Chamber of Commerce or the British Chamber of Commerce, I mean, they're a subset. And then above them is what's called the ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce. So it's 45 million companies. They have a sustainability, you know, like all great NGOs or, you know, they, they've got a, a policy. So they approached us and said, hey, we like what you're doing. Of course, we're like going, wow, could you take us out to the world? The reality is not everybody's interested in what we're doing, but they're getting interested. And, it, and it's just this door opening process, but we're educating the ICC as much as they're educating us. 
So then the World Bank came along. The World Bank, they know that they could have a, a direct influence on how carbon becomes an asset class, how carbon becomes fungible. Fungibility is really important in carbon. Again, if you go back to the EU, uh, the EUA's European allowance market, it's a market that I can invest in the EUA, but I can't use it for anything. It doesn't do anything for me in Singapore other than give me exposure to a price of a European allowance. World Bank is going the other way, going, hey, we've created some standards around the assets, how they're held, how they are defined to make sure that they're not double counted or double spent and because there is no marketplace. It's all sitting in individual registries today because that's how the industry grew to take it to the next level. So the World Bank is very focused on getting basically a carbon blockchain, a central carbon repository and registry for uh, credits. They've identified Singapore as one of those potential spots to do that in. The World Bank won't build it, but they will be very supportive of it. They want to see it run by the private sector. I think that's a good thing. Again, now you get fungibility. So a carbon credit produced in India's solar project becomes as relevant as a cook stove in Malawi as it is to a, a managed forest in Colombia. The funny thing is I was thinking about the other day, my thesis in university, I grew up in the United States, Eastern United States, New York, and I traveled extensively when I was a kid through, as kids do, you know, the summer weekends in the countryside and stuff like that. My dad was a camper and we used to go out to Pennsylvania quite a bit. Pennsylvania was a horribly dirty place. Bethlehem Steel and United States Steel, Pittsburgh and Bethlehem. And, and I just remember how dirty it was in the coal industry and stuff. And my senior thesis, I wrote on the, uh, it was just the beginning of the change for Pittsburgh. They were trying to, one of the rivers in Ohio had caught on fire outside of Cleveland. I mean, it was so toxic from refineries and Pittsburgh was a dying city. The U.S. steel industry first taken over by Japan and then Japan, then it went to Korea and then Korea to India. And then by that time it was a dying culture. And I was like, what could we do? Well, the first thing is we've got to clean it up. I mean, you go to Pittsburgh today, it's a stunningly beautiful city that has a museum that used to be a steel mill. At that time, it was the beginning of environmental awareness. Uh, never thought I'd be at this point in my life, but and I had forgotten about that for a lot of years that I actually written that paper, um, but it's relevant to what I'm doing today. But it took 40 years for us to get into this whole cycle of, of we don't move as quickly as we think we do sometimes. But I think we're finally here. We're finally at this point from a global recognition standpoint. I actually grew up in this business. My dad was a cotton trader. So uh, I grew up as a young kid visiting the cotton exchange in New York. And we actually had bales of cotton at, at our samples at our house. And my dad was a physicist. So that's, yeah, so I went from that to this. And, and, and it's not going to stop. It's, it's changing every day. Really neat. Great. Thank you, Tom. And uh, best of luck for August 19th and then for the soft launch and the go live in September. will be exciting to watch and we'll, we'll be cheering on from the sidelines. Thanks very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, Tom.